Uh, yeah, we're now live, Chair. Great, thank you. Uh, so a, a formal good morning and welcome to this meeting of the Sustainable Communities EAP. Uh, we're going to get started with any apologies for absence we've re received so far. Yeah, I've received apologies from Councillor Alison Dio. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any declarations of interest from members present at the moment? No. Good. And hopefully you've had a chance to read through the minutes of the last meeting, which are in the agenda pack. Um, and if everybody's happy with those, we'll take those. Okay. Good. Looks like we're happy with those. Okay, so we'll move on to the first substantive item, which is an update on the carbon management plan for quarter one, which hopefully you've had a, you've been able to have a look through the slides ahead of time as well. But this will be an interesting presentation and just show the progress that has been made. So I'm going to hand over to Nicole, if I may, um, to take us through this. Thank you. There, let me share my screen. All right, everybody see that? Yeah, okay. Hello everyone, thank you very much for having me. My name is Nicole Geary, I'm the project manager responsible for the delivery of the Carbon Management Plan program. I've been along, invited along today to share our first quarterly report with you. So the purpose of the quarterly report is to help the program team track progress of the 82 activities within the plan. As you will see, the report provides an overview of progress for each area and theme and identifies any ex exceptions that we may have for short, medium, or long-term activities. We wanted to capture progress since the program kicked off, so as a result, the reporting period is from January to May. So as you're probably already aware, there are eight thematic areas of focus within the CMP, which you can see outlined here. So we have assets and environment, behavior, carbon offsetting, carbon sequestration and biodiversity, fleet, highways and waste, procurement and supply chains, and travel. In a few minute moments, I'm going to go through the KPI dashboard for each one of these areas. But first up, we're going to have a look at overall progress for each area as a whole. So this slide shows an overview of the progress for each of the areas. The speedometers here indicate the percentage of projects in progress um, in each one of our areas. So starting on the left, the top left, we have assets and environment. We have 16 projects in that area with six in progress. So we have 38% rate of progress. For behavior, we have 10 total projects and four in progress at 40%. For carbon offsetting, we have eight projects and one in progress at 13%. For carbon sequestration and biodiversity, there are eight projects in total and two in progress at 25%. And then if we go to the bottom row on the left, we have fleet where there's 13 projects in total and seven in progress at 54%. And then we have highways and waste where there are six projects in total, five in progress at 83%. Then we have procurement and supply chains where there are 10 projects in total, six in progress at 60%. And lastly, we have travel where there are 11 projects in total and two in progress at 18%. Are there any questions about the speedometers before I move on to the KPI dashboards? Please shout out because I can't see any hands up. That's fine. I think perhaps if we um, do some questions at the end, that might be easy. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, so the first KPI dashboard that we have is for assets and environment. Um, for the KPI dashboards as a whole, you will see that they, they provide an overview, um, breaking down the progress for each area, as well as any risks identified within the activity terms. So if we have a look um, along the top row here, we have the term periods. So we have short-term, medium, and long-term. For short-term, these are activities that are projected to begin in the next one to two years. For medium, it's two to five years. And then for long-term, it's five plus years. So if we go down um, to the short-term activities for assets and environment, you see that we have five out of nine projects that are in progress at a 55% rate of progress. 
For medium term, there are no projects that have commenced as of yet. And then for long term, we have one project out of three that is currently in progress at 33%. And then along the bottom, you will notice that we have no exceptions to report for this area. So next we have behavior. So for behavior, you see that for short term, we have four out of five projects that are in progress at 80%. Positively, there are no risks or issues to report here. And then for medium and long term, there's currently there are currently no activities that are in progress at this time. Again, there are no exceptions for these two term periods. For carbon offsetting, progress is a bit slower. This is um, primarily linked to the fact that a lot of these activities are more strategic, which results in longer lead in times for progress. So for short term, we have one out of three of the projects that are in progress at 33%. And then again, for medium and long term, currently there are no projects that are in progress. Again, there are no uh, exceptions to report for this area. For carbon sequestration and biodiversity, for the short term, we have one out of four projects in progress, indicating a 25% rate of progress. For medium term, there are currently no projects in progress. And then for the long term, we have one out of the two uh, projects that are in progress at 50%. Again, there are no risks or issues to report here. So for fleets, you'll see that uh, fleet is progressing quite nicely. For short term, there are three out of six projects that are in progress at 50%. Um, however, we also have one project that has delivered, which is represented in the um, blue segment on the donut there. There are no risks or issues for the short-term activities. And for medium term, we have two out of five projects that are in progress, so 40% rate of progress there. Again, no risks or, issue, risks or issues. For long-term, we have um, both of the projects in the long-term um, that are in progress at the minute. So we have 100% rate of progress there. Again, no risks or issues. Next, we have highways and waste. This area is also progressing at a good rate of progress. For short, we have four out of the five projects in progress. Again, we also have one that has delivered in this area. Uh, there are no medium term activities within highways and waste. For long term, there's one project that is currently in progress. And then across the piece, there are no exceptions to report for this area. Next up, we have procurement and supply chains. Here you see that all of this, all six of the short-term activities are in progress. And then for the medium and long-term activities, these will be progressed at a later stage. So there is no progress to report as of yet. And then again, positively, there are no exceptions to report for this area. So lastly, we have travel. Here you will see that um, out of the five short-term activities, four have been delivered and one is still in progress. Similarly for medium, we have one activity in progress and one activity has also been delivered. For long-term, the one activity within this area has been delivered. And again, positively, there are no risks or issues to report for this area. Next, you can see this slide here, um, illustrates a snapshot of our carbon neutral journey to date, um, illustrating a few key uh, achievements that we've picked out to highlight for you. So starting at the top, we can see that 100% of our gridding fleet is now using hydro-treated vegetable oil instead of diesel. We have also identified 20 urban parks in Wellingborough for carbon storage. We have planted over 6,000 trees across North North Amp. Uh, within the highways area, 35% of our power-driven hand tools are now electric rather than petrol or diesel. And lastly, 37 members and 64 officers have now completed a carbon literacy course. Right, so that's the quarterly report for Q1. Are there any questions about any of the content that I've covered? Thank you, Nicole, for going through that. That's a useful update, and I think there is good progress across the board, considering that that's our quarter one um, update on it. 
I'm going to let the other members um, chip in with any questions they might have, and then perhaps I'll ask a, a couple at the end. So, um, Councillor Dell, you're first. Thank you, Chair, and um, thanks, Nicole, for the uh, for the update there. Um, it's good to see there's some more short-term mm -hmm. projects in there than there were in the March uh, one that I've just gone back to. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that are completed, I didn't know, because I mean, obviously, if there are people watching this on YouTube and they're interested in this, you know, seeing some graphs um, doesn't really mean a lot to them. I was just wondering if you could go into a bit more detail about which of the projects have been completed and how we're doing and stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, so for, I'll start with Fleet, because that was our first area where we've had a completion. We have, I'll tell you just a minute, let me look at my notes. So the activity that is about um, introducing driver awareness courses for um, the highways fleet, that um, has been picked up as part of the Keir Highways contract. So that's why that one has been delivered. So Keir Highways is providing driver operator training regarding um, the fleet that is used in North North Ants. Um, for highways and waste, the activity there is in regards to our gridding fleet being switched over to HVO fuel source. For travel, there are quite a few in there. Um, those are around internal policies. So the first one um, is in regards to our hybrid way, ways of working. So about our um, future ways of working strategy and that we have now adopted a hybrid model of, of working for staff. That was the first one. Another one is about um, standardizing our management responsibilities through appraisals and process monitoring. This is also picked up as part of the future ways of working strategy and HR feels that this has been completed within that launch of that strategy. And then we have review and update um, related council policies for business travel. So this was about our use of gray fleet. So how much staff are using their personal vehicles for work purposes. Um, so that is a standardized approach that we use in terms of, you know, what, how we claim our business mileage and whatnot. And, um, HR felt that restricting the use further, you know, for other service areas, say for adult social care, um, that's for the services er service areas to cover in their revised service plans, which is still an activity within the carbon management plan that is being worked on. So more to come on the individual um, changes for that policy. Then we had low carbon courses for electric scooters and bicycles. This is provided by VOI. Um, they have a compulsory safety course that everyone hiring a scooter has or a bike has to complete before the first time they, they hire one of those. So that closed off. And then in the medium term for travel still, um, we again had another action around the gray fleet. And as I just said, this will sit with individual service areas to include within their service plans. We had one long term that's been delivered, and that was about us as an organization um, changing our approach and policy to reduce great fleet emissions. And as I said, that will be picked up in the service plans as part of our um, carbon considerations in those areas going forward and how those service areas can reduce their great fleet emissions. That was all of the, the ones that have been. That's all the completed ones. Okay, brilliant. I mean, I've got further questions. Is there, so all of this, all of these specific um, targets, are they um, somewhere publicly assess accessible? So that. Okay, Do you not, mean the KPIs? Not the KPIs, well, the, the KPIs, but also the actual specific. Things. Yeah, so all of these, um, the actual activities are in the carbon management plan, which is public on our website. Yeah. Okay. That's cool, cool. Because I'm, I'm confused about the hybrid model. I mean, I thought we were doing that already. Um, yeah, exactly. I think it was added into the plan before the strategy was published on uh, on the internet. So, um, yeah, I think it was kind of one of the things that happened at the same time as as the future ways of working strategy going out. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and like the driver awareness courses, is that how does that help have a management plan? I'm For the voice scooters, I think it's because right. we're encouraging the use of um, an electric mode of transport rather than people using vehicles. Right, okay, okay. Essentially not electric. And the appraisals, how, how is there like a, how, how do, like, um, these are the sort of things that seem like yeah. they're quite sort of, um, not, I don't want to say tacked on to like this, but like, um, you know, it's not like we're going to make everybody have solar on their houses or stuff like that. It's not like <laughs> big, big ticket items. Um, it's It seems like quite low hanging. And I guess that's why 
it's um it's been completed so soon but i was just wondering if you could if we've got anything sort of meaty in progress um the meaty things would have been the the fact that our fleet has all switched over to a sustainable fuel source i would say at the minute and the fact that we are you know out planting trees and trying to identify sites for carbon storage and things like that for our biodiversity um those are the meaty the meaty elements at the minute but there's a lot of work happening in the background <laughs> I'm all yeah thanks nicole thank you Ollie. you're welcome and I just thought maybe I'll just chip in on a couple of those bits as well um, for you, Councillor Dell. So with regard to the, the voice scooters, one of the, the bits around the safety training that I can perceive is um, positive is some people perhaps wouldn't feel confident changing onto those without the, the training. I know I, I've um, had some training on those and I wouldn't want to otherwise um, just to, to make sure I fully understood it. So having that, I think, perhaps helps people in that journey of transitioning to those modes of transport. Um, and on the other meaty bits, so to speak, um, last week at exec committee, uh, we had a paper which highlighted some of the projects that were being funded as part of the carbon uh, climate change funding. So we've got um, detailed decarbonisation surveys for lots of the, the buildings across NNC, um, which will then hopefully enable us to start bidding for um, further funding as well as part of those and the, the identified actions. So those are really big pieces of work that um, are important. Um, and I'm sure as we get going with those projects, they'll be reported in these um, going forward as well. Um, Councillor Bone. Thank you, Chair. Um, so Councillor Dell raised one of my points which you've answered thank you if somebody is just logging into this uh who's interested um i quite like the simple um graphs and the figures it, it's quite clear the projects themselves are listed are they quite easily accessible for somebody who's just logged into this and thought okay I, i'd not quite like to know what the um you know, the four projects are. So I know you've explained them, Nicole, which is great, um, but are they easily accessible for somebody to log on to the portal to find out? That, that's my first question. The second one, um, right at the end, 37 members having completed the course, what's the next step to encourage the other 50 odd percent? Because uh, I think that's still, I, I know um, there's an issue there. I just wonder what we're doing about <laughs> um, reinvigorating the uh, um, for the rest of the members to do that. I think it's important that we all do. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. So, to so your first question about the, um, sorry, my brain has just about the. Um, oh, sorry, can you remind me? I've just like lost it there. <laughs> That's okay. A list, a list of the different yeah. projects. Yes. Yeah, so to, to, to match with the figures. So in the carbon management plan on the website, they're broken down into the thematic areas. So somebody, if they're interested in, a, in the fleet project, can go to fleet and they're all listed underneath there. So it's quite accessible on our website to have a look at those. We are working on developing more um, like user friendly pages that we hope to add to the website in the in the coming weeks and months. So um, there will definitely be more content available for anyone that would like to see it um, soon. And then also about the carbon literacy training, we um, one of the activities in the plan is about developing a new curriculum for the carbon literacy training that will be opened up to all members and officers. Um, I know, I believe Greg Haynes is working with learning and development on that currently to get that curriculum squared away. And as soon as it's ready to go, I believe we're gonna launch it to the rest of the members and senior management, and then it will cascade down to all the um, other officers in the organization who like to take it and I believe it's going to be a mandatory training requirement and just to add as well from a member perspective so thank you for Nicole for that information um as you would hope I've been encouraging members to undertake the training um there are other opportunities to undertake carbon literacy training outside of the council that are available to members and been encouraging people to do so where they can where there's perhaps not where we're just in between um and so i've been contacting members about that and, and assisting any where i can with bits of information to help them complete it and, and get onto these other training courses um because it is a valuable tool like you say 
Okay. Um, are there any other questions at this point? We're, we're happy to, to note the progress that is being made. Um, see nodding and ped and we look forward to to hearing what's happening over the coming months so thank you um nicole and your team for the hard work that is has not only gone into that presentation but also all the work going on in the background to get those little dials ticking uh, across to complete the projects etc thank you you're welcome thank you so we're now going to move on to um another Bit of an update on the local nature recovery strategy we've obviously discussed that before and again a bit of an update so i'll hand over to andrew for this that was uh, have difficulties finding the button because it all disappeared when you start sharing screen and um, so thank you for having me along today my name's andra stockforth from the planning side of the council um, just a bit of my background if I haven't met you before um, I'm a planner and I've worked um, in this area for quite some time prior to North North Hans Council I was working at the joint planning unit with a focus on strategic planning and the environmental policies within the core strategy so I've got a keen interest in the environment um, so I'm very pleased to be able to take this on as a role going forward um, and I think now's a really good time to update as we're really starting on the journey for the North North Hans Local Nature Recovery Strategy. So I'm just going to... Next screen. Okay. Is there a secret button? I'm not sure why it's not now sharing the screen. So I'm sorry about that. Has that worked? So, fingers crossed. <laughs> so, North Northamptonshire Council um, is set to be a responsible body, which is a new uh, responsible authority, I should say, which is a new term set out in the Environment Act. Um, we've already had dialogue with DEFRA along this line, but I think the formal letter is yet to be received and the formal designation is yet to be received. There has been a slight delay with that. We'd expected it earlier this month but um, we're hopeful that it's going to be by the end of June, but there's some, some certain works that need to take place through for every authority or every responsible authority before they can um, make those announcements. So we're, we're just clarifying with Natural England at the moment on what that needs to be. There's another term as well called supporting authorities that through your process of your local nature recovery strategy development that you need to consult with them and that they need to broadly agree the contents. Now, in North Northamptonshire, we just have Natural England as a supporting authority in two tier areas where it's more likely to be the County Council undertaking the strategy. They would need to have consulted with an agreement with all of the um, other tiers of authority. So in that way, we're, we're gonna be a bit more streamlined and hopefully things can move along quickly on that element. So work started on some areas, which we'll go into a little bit more um, later on in the presentation. And it's also set out that the time frame or the pilots that undertook this a couple of years ago, it took them 12 to 18 months from start to finish to have their local nature recovery strategy in place. So that's the, the time frame that we're anticipating as well. But we need to do a bit more work planning to work through the particular dates on that one. It should also be pointed out that we're still waiting for quite a lot of guidance and information to be released from DEFRA and Natural England that will help every authority progress their work in this area. So just moving on to funding and resources, um, we have received as an authority some seed funding for this and it's not been a huge amount, but it's been able to start the process in some areas and consider we can start considering what work we need to take place but with that announcement of being a responsible authority we they will then also release us some more funding to actually take um to use to deliver the local nature recovery strategy and that is embargoed until we have that announcement but it is a sufficient amount of money we think to be able to undertake this piece of work 
Um, we have a secondment in place that is going to focus on the local nature recovery strategy, so that's my position. Um, and I'll also be undertaking the work on biodiversity net gain as well. So there's two very key statutory pieces of work that are coming online through the Environment Act. Um, and my role is to try and progress those through and make sure that the authority is ready and has the documentation ready for the LNRS, but also biodiversity net gain, which becomes mandatory in November. So there's quite a lot of work to take place on that in the meantime. And I'd also like to point out that the local nature partnership in this area um, is now very active again, and they're looking at how they can support the process. There's um, a lot of the partners on there, obviously key stakeholders as well. They have a lot of knowledge and information in the area. Um, and we, we're going to be working very closely with them and seeing what work that they can undertake for the authority to progress the LNRS. So in order to manage all of this, then obviously we need some good governance in place. So initial governance structure has been put in place, and I think that's been seen by various groups throughout the council and executive. And we're working with the West. So whilst we're going to have two separate local nature recovery strategies, there's going to be a lot of cross-boundary issues, particularly along the NEEN and special protection areas that all need to be worked into the local nature recovery strategy. So we'll be working closely with the West and it should be pointed out that a lot of stakeholders will be covering the, the old county, if you like, and won't want to start consulting on two different documents. So where possible, we'll be doing joint consultations with West North Hans, but at the end of the day, there will be two separate documents produced. So just an outline of the governance structure that you may have seen in other documents. So we'll have our oversight group with which will be mainly from the authority with our Natural England senior advisor. Every um, local nature recovery strategy will have a specific senior advisor from Natural England to, to be the liaison and to help progress things and to undertake certain pieces of work for us as well, which is a, a good benefit. And then we've got the delivery group, which will predominantly be made up of local nature partnership members and drawn in at specific times, but to really keep them updated and make sure that we've got their work areas reflected into the strategy and vice versa, um, which will become key when we start looking at the delivery of what's in the document. And then underneath that, we're going to have several working groups. These haven't necessarily been finalised at the moment, but these are the areas that we're thinking will need some specific quite detailed work taking place on. So just talking a bit more about the stakeholder engagement. So we will need to produce a stakeholder engagement plan. We've already done some early work with the, the NRT and <laughs> WLT. So that's the Nen Rivers Trust and the Wildlife Trust that cover this area. They've done some early engagement with landowners and farmers to make them aware of the strategy. We had to do that at the beginning of the year to make sure that they had um, time to be able to do that. They weren't out working on the farms so much at, in February. So those steps have been um, put in place and they've also done uh, an initial look through all the different stakeholders in this area. Um, so we need to look at any gaps within that and then we need to think about the different strategies that we will have for those different stakeholder and community groups, because that's likely to change over time. We're going to have um, a lot wider consultation to start with, and then we might go into more specifics later on. Um, but within that, we need to be um, aware of any risks around that wider engagement, because we might not be able to keep everybody happy within the document. So it's going to have to be considered and look to see what we can actually achieve through the local nature recovery strategy so that yeah that will change over time and the main reason for all of that stakeholder is to get that robust well-evidenced local nature recovery strategy that will reflect what the partners are already working on what we're aspiring to do as an authority but also what those stakeholders and communities want to see for nature recovery within north northamptonshire so there's two main areas really that is set out in the initial guidance that we do have, and that's mapping. So 
we need to map all of our baseline information. So it's fairly prescriptive and not very wide ranging, it has to be said. So, but that's to get a common base all across the country so that um, anyone can look on that wherever they are and know what they're going to be seeing. But then where it becomes slightly more interesting is that we're then going to be mapping areas that could have particular importance for biodiversity and nature recovery following that stakeholder engagement. So that's the map that will start saying, this is where we want to achieve this, and this is this, um, and, and probably then work into how that will be delivered. So that will result in the local habitats map, which is a technical term, if you like. And then alongside that, we'll have the documentation, which will be a description of the area. It will use the stakeholder feedback to say what areas are important for the local population. Importantly, it will also identify what the opportunities for recovery. And this is where tying in the local nature recovery strategy with biodiversity net gain is quite important. And as an authority, we understand and we're recognising that those two go hand in hand because we can look at certainly our own land assets for what we could do for nature recovery and how that could be delivered through a scheme such as biodiversity net gain. Um, biodiversity net gain is going to be quite an important delivery mechanism for the local nature recovery strategy for certain elements. So it's important that we see those synergies happening between the two projects. Um, there'll also be the agreed priorities for the documents and the measures that we will have in place and all of that combined. So we have our mapping on one side and then on this side, we have our statement of biodiversity priorities. And that's what we would look at then to achieve. Um, other things that we would use for, to build on for the documentation is the, the Northamptonshire Biodiversity Action Plan. We, there's so much information in there that is still relevant for all the different habitats and locations of those. And also within our area, we've got a natural capital investment plan that is in the sort of final stages of being completed. And that builds on many years worth of work through the Nen Valley Nature Improvement Area designation many years ago, where we've looked at all our ecosystem service mapping. That's moved on to habitat opportunity mapping, and that's now evolved into a, a natural capital investment plan. And within that document, it will be looking at how we can, what we can take forward based on all of that map, on all of those evidence, what's a logical way forward. Um, it's also going to have local case studies that have been looked at to say this is what the baseline is and through these improvements, this is the, the final out output or, or this is what could be achieved on that site for um, ecosystem improvements. So using that document and there's not many local authorities in the area or across the country even that have got that far so we're in a very very good place for taking that and rolling it forward and putting it into an all-encompassing strategy so we're, we're very positive that we've got that and and we're hoping that um and and that certainly is recognized with partners and certainly natural england think that we're in a very good place which is good so the next steps we really have are, as I said, the work plan to, to see how, when we might be able to start adopting the local nature recovery strategy. But in order to do that, we'll fully establish those working groups and the governance structure and the terms of reference of each of those. Further work on the engagement and consultation. And we've got a local nature partnership meeting on Thursday this week, where we'll be talking about um, who could do what or which, which groups of people or communities we would need to engage with first. Um, the mapping has been started by the GIS team at the council and through all of that, we'll start identifying our priority areas. But we also recognize there is a lot of work to be doing and we do have some capacity funding coming in. So we will need to give some consideration to what might be outsourced um, because at the end of the day, we will need quite a, a nice looking document to have on our website. So there's a lots of lots to be considered over the next months um, to keep us busy. So really, I've just put any questions and my contact details on there. And I'd just like to point out that all the photos through that presentation are ones that I've just taken as I've been walking around various nature areas. And but don't ask me what they are. 
<laughs> I, I, I can't do that. But um, Chris Haynes, when I sent him this presentation, was able to name most of them just by sight. So <laughs> I think that was very impressive. But any questions, just please let me know. Fantastic. Thank you. And those pictures are really, really good, um, particularly one of the um of the insects um, pollinating etc so any we've got hands up for questions already councillor bone sorry thank you chair well I, i'm not going to put you on the spot andra um <laughs> that, that would be too mean um i, I thought it was brilliant um with my other hat of planning interest i think this is just so key the um Responsible authority, I know that we're expecting um, that letter to arrive and then funding. My concern is if the funding isn't what you guys are expecting, that impact on what we can do, how far quickly this can go through with all the actions that you've just uh, outlined. That, that's my main concern, I suppose. But you answered right at the end about engagement um, and consultation because that's huge isn't it and so you've got a meeting next week did you say or this week it's actually sorry. this Thursday at Chester okay. um, yes. yeah brilliant yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean that's one of my concerns I think that will be that's just careful, isn't it so sorry I've written that down and then you had answered it so I just wanted to comment a bit and um, we have tried to clarify with Natural England and DEFRA because we had a one-to-one -one meeting with them um, probably about a month ago where they outlined the funding that was envisaged. We've clarified with Natural England that because of the delay, is there any change to that funding position? And they've said that there isn't. So we're still pretty confident that we can deliver with the funding that's been outlined. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dell. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Andrew. That's a great, um, I've, it's a great, great, great presentation. I'm glad that you're like putting all your all into this. Um, has been seconded onto it. I've got a few questions. Um, first of all, you mentioned already the Northamptonshire Biodiversity Action Plan. Um, that was 2015 to 2020. Is this to replace that, or is this going to work alongside it? Or is the Biodiversity Action Plan going to be updated as part of this project? Um, do you want to do questions at one at a time? <laughs> Might be best, <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, we are aware that the um, the BAP that is published at the moment does only run, it says on the title, it's to 2020. And the Local Nature Partnership were looking at updating it, but that was when the Environment Act was introduced and this concept around local nature recovery strategies. So it's decided to pause at that point to see what the regulations were going to say. And then obviously there were lots of delays alongside that. Um, and we still don't have all of those regulations. But whilst it says 2020 on the Biodiversity Action Plan, it doesn't mean it's out of date. It's all completely relevant. Nothing changes that quickly, thankfully, in the biodiversity world. And those habitats that are identified in there are still the habitats, priorities that we'll be looking for. So um, we, we, we could look at updating that as we progress because there's links in with biodiversity net gain and how we use the metric and the BAP. Um, but at the moment, I don't think it's seen as a priority because we can still use the information within it. That's fair. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, I mean, I know the local nature recovery strategy is quite a long term prospect, but what when it's completed, um, will that give extra protection to areas from, say, warehouses development or something like that? Because um, obviously Northamptonshire is the county of warehouses. Um, and I'm presuming as well that it won't have any if there's planning permission already in place or not planning permission plan applications it won't have any effect on those if they were put in before the local nature recovery strategy um does that make sense yes um so we're in a good position because we're in the process of updating our local plan and this is running alongside it and obviously from my background working with the strategic planning team I've talked to them every day so we're very much of the mind that the local nature recovery strategy is going to be a key piece of evidence so they will work in tandem together and so once that local plan is adopted and includes the local nature recovery strategy areas and the priorities and the locations then they'll become a material planning consideration so again we're there's not many places in the country that are like that so it's a real good benefit that we have and in terms of 
so yeah planning applications that are going through the process I mean we have to just take those as they are and then if things change then we could look at that and this is where the stakeholder engagement is going to be quite interesting to manage because we need to manage expectations on what can actually be achieved through this when there's a lot of other things going on in the background so it can't sort of come in now and veto areas because that's that's not the purpose of it mm. um we need to work work together i think and hopefully that's answered your question we, we should be in a really good place in 18 months as things start to be adopted and and work together so that's the plan yeah so so just on the note on the new sort of local plan will that um, replace the existing local plan like the local plans for Kettering and Corby the ones that are in place already or is it addition to there'll be a transition period so not being at the forefront of that Sorry. so we, at the moment we have our joint core strategy and then the local plan part twos mm -hmm. so as we move forward we're more likely to have but this has got to go through a process and to be agreed and in the local development scheme that we will have our local plan for North Northamptonshire and with planning reform a lot of that could change uh, and the status of other documents so an eye is being kept on that as well but yes so the local plan as it will be called in the future for North Northamptonshire will take into account all of these different aspects uh, um, across North Northamptonshire not going to have we well, don't think we're going to be having those part twos that go into more detail but that's why the scope of the plan's being looked at at the moment. We've already had early consultation on that um, just over a year ago, and I think that's been reported to the it, what it was the planning policy EAP at the time. That's brilliant. All right, thanks, Andrea. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, does uh, Councillor Dell, did you have any other questions? You're you're all good. No, I'm all good. Thank you. That's fine. I could see the hand up. Um, so, Councillor O'Hara. Thank you, Chair. Sorry I couldn't get online. <laughs> I don't know what was wrong with my system. Anyway, um, thank you for the presentation. It was fabulous. Um, I, following on from what Councillor Dells just said, I, I do have a concern. I think it's fabulous what we're doing and that we're at the forefront of, of protecting our spaces. Um, but it does concern me that within, I know you you, you understand the, the SSP too, etc. But Part of the review that was taking place um, all that time ago, um, some of our open spaces and our habitats aren't protected any longer because there was two different reviews. There's one inspector looked at Corby and one looked at our uh, within Kettering area. So therefore, a lot of the open spaces and the places of historical um, interest, visual, historical and visual interest, were taken out. Um, so therefore, we don't have that protection to make sure that these areas aren't built on, um, whether it be housing or warehousing, whichever. And, and that is a concern because once you lose those habitats, you lose them forever. Um, and, and I just wondered if there is a, a way forward of protecting those now that isn't going to be 18 months away. I, I appreciate we can't do anything with planning are in now but just a way of protecting them and protecting those open spaces and making sure developers don't come back and say, well, actually that space isn't used. Can we put three more houses in there? Which is what has happened in the past, um, which is why it's important to protect the open spaces. And I think one of the ways people do it is through the village plans, but obviously they take, or parish plans, whatever you want to term them as, um, but they do take time and obviously it relies on volunteers within the village, it relies on knowledge, it relies on getting um, that liaison with officers and having that support from officers and, you know, uh, the, the, it's the time element, isn't it? And time is so precious, you know, it's 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 gone in an instant, you don't get it back. And I, I think from what you're saying, this is going to take time to put in place. So I'm absolutely stoked that we are at the forefront of doing this but I am really concerned that for the land that's left we need desperately to try and protect it and protect it for future generations you know for mental physical well-being and and for the animals and, and this planet basically so I just wondered if there's anything we can do in the meantime because across the whole of North North Ants you've got different um different reviews have been undertaken and so the Sun Village is going to be protected and St Anne's will be protected, but some areas will just be left behind. And that's a concern. So I don't know whether there's anything you can do within your remit to protect those and, and take it forward in a, a more timious manner with our partners, really. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, there's quite a lot to that that question. And certainly open space is is 
a different sort of category, if you like, through the core strategy or the part two local plans and the, the designations of those and the evidence that has gone into that. So I would assume that each of the four partner local authorities, I can't say that, partner authorities, each of the old local authority areas would have done their open space assessments and that would have been evidenced and then gone into their part two local plans. And then there's different standards. So there might be slightly different standards for Kettering versus Corby versus Wellingborough versus East North Hants. So the case officers would need to look at that evidence when they're determining applications to find out uh, the use of it, the quality of it. Um, and this is more open space for, for play, I would have thought, rather than large areas for nature recovery, because that would come under other policies. Um, so it's really for case officers to understand that evidence base behind it when they're making their decisions and and certainly there's lots of work taking place on that so I, I wouldn't be too concerned about that um, and there's certainly representations that can be put in or to like you say to improve the quality of local life to have those open spaces available there's a, another there's another couple of elements to that. I suppose biodiversity net gain, we are applying that as an authority now. We have a policy in our core strategies that says no net loss. So we are looking for at least 1% BNG on applications that are coming in now. When that when we get to mandatory in November, that's when we would be asking for the 10%, um, which isn't very many months away. And through that, they either have they have to follow the mitigation hierarchy. So that will be on site that will avoid any sensitive habitats in the first place then it has to be on site delivery and then it can be off site delivery so we are working to make sure we have well ideally we'd have some sort of national design guide that would help achieve it on site but we are in north Northampton. we've got three habitat banks where applicants can go to them to provide their off-site provision to make sure they're meeting their biodiversity net gain requirements for policy and obviously when it comes to November it has to be done there's you we won't as an authority be allowed to permit any applications without that 10% net gain so that's a really good thing as it's moving forward it is but can that be will that be conditioned I know it's within the remit and, and it'll be enforced come November but is that going to be a condition of if each planning application then yes you know? yes so we won't they won't we can only approve if they send in certain information and they can only commence once they've sent in a biodiversity action, a habitat, what's it called, a biodiversity plan alongside their application that the authority has to approve. Which so, is what they do when they go for the outline planning permission, that will be a condition of it to get yes. the outline. Yes, there's certain things come November that they have to do albeit we're still waiting for the secondary legislation on that at the moment. So. so we can instigate it now. That's what I was guessing at, because it is coming in in November. We can only do the 1% at the minute, 10% won't be till November. That's what our local policy is. So as far as we can, we are following the direction of travel okay. that the national policy is taking in the local area. Um, so that's good. And then there's another project um, some of you might be familiar with in the Rocky and Forest area. So there's the Building the Links project and within that they've got funding to support 10 parish nature recovery plans so I think that's all being led by the Nen Rivers Trust and they have two officers that are working in the Rocky and Forest area and they they've got I think they've got 10 if not more parishes or friends of parks in certain areas but the area for that is really the northern I think it does cover Corby and I do think it covers Rothwell as well so it's it's quite north of North Northamptonshire so those parishes will be looking at what they can achieve within this local area um, so we'll be reflecting we're talking to we will be talking to them which will be sharing mapping work with them but that's where big changes can happen on the ground and it's quite an exciting project um, and the lessons learned from that, we could then hopefully roll that out as an option for other parishes, towns, friends of groups across the, the authority area in due course. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Dell, 
and then I'll go to Council O'Hara. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> um, just a quick query on the 10% BNG. Um, it's, I've, it was my understanding that 10% is a minimum and that some councils have actually set like 20% or potentially even more as their standard. Is that something we'll be looking at to perhaps go ahead more than the minimum? It's something that some authorities are looking at and certainly the um, ARC level, I can't remember, Pan Regional ARC or whatever it's called now, um, they were looking at doing 20% across the ARC area. Um, but as a local authority, we would need to test the viability and also the deliverability of that. And that's where a lot of the, um, that's where the natural capital investment plan is looking at at the moment. So there's lots of things about 30 for 30 or 20 for 20 being talked about. So they're looking what's actually achievable within our area. So once we have that evidence base combined with the viability and then look at the local, what the local plan policy could be. Um, so yeah, we, it could be higher. It could be the, the 10%, but I know some of the local authority areas that have gone higher then the viability does change quite a bit between the 10 and the 20. So uh, within this area, we need to have that balance of the other requirements that would need to come through for development, other infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Hara. Sorry, Chair, <laughs> Councillor Dell's just asked what I wanted to ask. Um, but the other question I wanted to ask was um, the access um, points, um, we are talking about the River Nen, et cetera, that is becoming increasingly harder to access for people um, as more and more people utilise the river areas. I think people are well aware I paddleboard a lot. Um, and um, the damage that is done by people has has caused a bit of a detraction of access um, and I, I know the friends of the river then have tried to help with that but there's some villages now taking it upon themselves to say you know please don't launch from here you, you're damaging the, the natural environment you're damaging the habitats what are we doing to support access and and you know because you, you buy a river license and therefore it, gives, it allows you access but and the signs aren't you know a really a request they're not a, a, an impetus to do to not access but it is becoming increasingly harder for people to access whether they want to go paddleboard or kayak. So, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed because we're addressing walkways, et cetera, but we're not addressing river access and also the pollution therein. Every time I go out, I take a bag with me and I pick up so much rubbish out of those rivers. It's ridiculous. I always fill a bin bag, always. Mm. Um, so that that's a concern for me, you know, and I, I'm not the only one who does it. Uh, and, and increasingly with this warm weather, there's even more rubbish floating along the rivers and along the river 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 sides um, and that's a concern for me because you know it, it's it, it's always a concern with chemicals and and whatever water boards might put out into the rivers but it's what you see visually as well and, and uh, I don't know how we can allow better access and work with the habitats to maintain them I didn't know whether that's something that you're doing I'm presuming that's that you are Yes, it's one of those careful balancing acts, isn't it? And it's very disappointing to hear that that's how the river's being used in some cases. But education and awareness will have to be done around that matter. And it's something I can speak to the Environment Agency, see if they're doing anything, because in the past they've looked at canoe portages at various locations, um, if they're managing those appropriately or if there needs to be more work done on, like you say, where people are accessing potentially in inappropriate places. Um, so I can take that up. I'm not sure whether it's something that would be covered in the local nature recovery strategy, albeit the special protection area and the importance of the river would, but the managing access um, might need to come through a different mechanism. OK, it, well, it was just an aside, really. I mean, Ward and her have tried to do it whereby you can park for four hours um, and have allowed access again, but they have got a warning up to say it's dangerous. Well, it will be because it's not far from a weir and then it's the access out to Peterborough. But then they've put a sign up saying police don't access because it damaged the habitat. The habitat was actually done by horses going down to get the water. Um, but I take it on board that there are people there that perhaps don't look after the habitat as well as they should or respect people's privacy for the gardens that back on to the rivers. It's just, a, it is a, a fine balancing act to maintain our habitats and give people some pleasure in being able to access water and all the walkways along there. I mean, it's fabulous at the minute because everything's blooming, but you know, uh, and it needs to be fabulous all year round. But thank you for that. That'd be wonderful if you could take that up. Um, just one thing, you mentioned a Friends of the River Neen group. I don't think I've got their contact details. So if you're able to send anything over, that would be 
um, great. And I can add them to the stakeholder engagement. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yes, I will do. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for all of those questions and to Andra for going through the presentation for us, which was really useful. Um, so as there's no other hands up, we'll leave that item there and move on to the last one, which is um, just kind of a standing item to note, which is the forward plan for the EAP. Uh, there's on some of the meetings further into the future, we obviously haven't got agenda items yet, um, but some of those are almost a year away. So by that point, we will certainly have many more items on there. And obviously um, we will be adding more items to the, the list as we get closer to those meetings. Councillor Dow, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Can I formally request um, the uh, uh, some kind of a flood response team uh, on one of the future meetings um, I know we've got a flood officer now and yesterday in Ketchum there was quite a lot of flash flooding um, that came with the rain and it'd be good to sort of get an update from um, our flood team about what the plans are for the future um, to deal with flooding and stuff in the um, in the North Northlands area. Thanks. Yep that that's absolutely fine your request is formally accepted <laughs> on that one and we'll we'll make sure we add that in at the appropriate point um, but we'll we'll get that sorted for the forward plan. Thank you. Um, so if everybody else is happy, that brings us to the end of this meeting. Thank you all for your attendance, officers and members, um, for the work that you've put in on this. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next meeting. <laughs>